Hello there and welcome to this edition of Talk Vietnam. The happiness and a happiness that sustains is one of the many common goals that we share in life. But what exactly is happiness? Is it dependent on each and every one of us? Or is it more in essence the same principle for all of us? And brought to the level of a nation, how does the happiness index compare to an economic one? These are some of the questions that our guest today will answer in this edition of Talk Vietnam. Our guest is Dr. Ha Vinh Thao. He is the program director of the Bhutan Gross National Happiness Center. Hello, Dr. Ha Vinh Thao. Thank Hello. you so much for joining us here today. My pleasure. If I may start now on the definition of happiness. Um, many say that happiness is a feel-good mood. What do you think about that definition? I think they are like two different levels of happiness. One is uh, more superficial, as you said, feel good mood, that, that this always comes and goes. And then I think there's a deeper layer of happiness that one can experience when one feels that one's life is meaningful, that one is uh, connected, deeply connected with one's own purpose in life, with the people around us, and also with nature. Some yes. might say, you know, that happiness is about the pursuit. In today's modern society, it might be the pursuit of, um, you know, as much material goods as possible. Would that be part of the more shallow definition of happiness, you think? Definitely, because uh, I think we can all experience that, uh, let's say we buy a new item, let's say a new phone, a new car, or whatever it is. For a short time, we might feel satisfied by it. But the satisfaction is very short-lived. Mm -hmm and very soon we need something else. So it's not something that gives long-lasting fulfillment. How about long-lasting happiness? In many of the research that I have looked at, um, many say that altruism is the most long-lasting type of happiness. Can you please elaborate on this? Uh, compassion, altruism, generosity, pro-social behavior, these kind of qualities are a source of long-lasting happiness. And now we even have like brain research that mm -hmm. shows that if people have gratitude, if people are generous, if people are altruistic, then it stimulates certain parts of the brain that are connected with happiness and well-being. Oh, so when you are good to others, then that goodness in turn makes you happy. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Born in France to a Vietnamese father and French mother, Ha Vinh Tha grew up in Switzerland. He holds a PhD in psychology and education from the University of Geneva. He has been the head of training, learning, and development at the International Committee of the Red Cross from 2005 to 2011. He is also the founder and chairman of Eurasia Foundation, a humanitarian NGO developing educational programs for children and youth living with disabilities, as well as ecological projects in Vietnam. Accompanying Dr. Ha in all of his projects is his wife, Lisi Ha Vig. The two have been married for more than 40 years. They met in Vienna, Austria, and would later join in demonstrations in Europe to call for an end to the then ongoing Vietnam War. Our whole life is a love story, a love story for each other, but also for our family, friends, and it's really a love story for Vietnam. Both owning an affinity towards charity work, the couple and their two children made the decision to live in the Camp Hill Percival community in Switzerland for 20 years. Here, the family lived alongside seven children and teens living with different types of mental disabilities for 12 years. Dr. Ha and Lisi both worked as physiotherapists and special education instructors for the youth. When you live day in, day out, morning, evening, night, Saturday, Sunday, with seven young people with autism, you discover your own limits, you discover your own fears, you discover your patience, you discover your courage. And most of all, I think you discover a great love for the human being in whatever form. Now you and Lizzie spent uh, around 20 years in a community called Camp Hero Perceval um, and that is in Switzerland where you strive to live in a different way. Can you tell us about uh, this community? How was it different? We tried to live a kind of a social experiment 
in different ways. The first one was that we took uh, children with disabilities in our families and we had between 7 and 12 youngsters with disability, quite severe disability like autism, yes. Down syndrome and others, living together with us and our family. So it was not li uh, working for them, but living with them. The other experiment, which is maybe even more innovative, was that we didn't get a salary. Mm. But all the, mother that, uh, the money that came in was shared among all the, the members of the community. We were quite a large community, maybe 100, more than 100 wow. person people. And we would then discuss who needs what. And it worked very well. Mm. So that was a very interesting experiment to separate income from work. What led to the decision of you and your wife um, wanting to pursue that lifestyle? We believe that uh, the way modern life has moved away from village into the nuclear family, just uh, mommy, daddy and a child, something like that, was not really sustainable. We observed that there was a lot of loneliness, many divorces, many people not feeling really happy with their life. So we wanted to see, is it possible to have a different lifestyle where we share much more, we serve much more, and where our children would grow up in an environment where they learned uh, human values. Mm. And both our children grew up in this community, and uh, when they look back and we ask them today, so how was it growing there? They both loved it because the, the co-workers had many children, so they were like a group of maybe 20 children, always having fun together. We had a big park, we had a swimming pool, we had horses, we had a farm. <laughs> so it was, they were living as if they were very rich kids, yes. <laughs> but they were not at all. But it, just, it was the community that could supply or you know, mm -hmm. offer conditions that hardly any child can have normally. Success or um, money was not the goal, but the, money was, the, the goal was to try to serve. I understand now that you also spent time working for uh, the International Red Cross and visiting many war zones. Um, tell us about this time, how it impacted your life. In this Camp Hill community, I was uh, in charge of the training. Of the, so it was also at the same time a social school, so I was the director of the social school. And at that time, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is based in Geneva, uh, was looking for a new director of learning and development. My job was to prepare uh, the staff that we were recruiting to go into war zones and conflict mm. areas. And then, I, after about seven or eight months, I would go and join them to see if the training that we gave them allowed them to meet the realities of the field because most of them had never been in their life in a war zone. You called this time when you visited different war zones one of the moments in your life that was a wake-up moment that kind of gave you a revelation. Can mm. you please share with us how did it impact you so strongly? I think what a, one of the trigger moments was uh, uh, I had several uh, missions in Darfur, West Sudan. At that time the civil war was terrible there. Most of the wars actually wars, wars over resources, especially oil. But in Darfur, it was not the case. There's no oil in Darfur. Yes. And then I realized, actually, it's uh, much worse. It's war around water. Wars around oil are very violent. But human beings can live without oil. Not as comfortably, but we can live without oil. Without water, we could not even survive three days. And because of climate change, because of the pollution of our environment, more and more water is becoming a very scarce resource. So I realized that in the future, the challenge will be war over water. And then I tried to understand, so what were the reasons that led us to this situation? And my insight was that actually it's because our economic system is depleting the planet because we have become so greedy mm. that we are willing to destroy our planets just to make more money. The work I was doing with the ICRC, International Committee of Red Cross, was very good, but it, it's not enough. I wanted to go upstream, meaning I wanted to try to touch the causes of the destruction, not once the destruction has already happened. In yes. the same way as a doctor, you might it's good to give medicine once the person is ill, but it's much better to help them prevent. So for society, it's the same. How can we create a more healthy society 
so that we don't go so far and come to destruction that I was witnessing. My research or my quest was, can we develop? Because we need development. But is it necessarily in contradiction with the preservation of values, with the preservation of culture, with the preservation of the, the environment? environment? Or is it necessary to destroy all these things in order to develop economically? Mm. So that was my quest, and that led me to uh, uh, find, about, uh, find out about cross national happiness. Bhutan is a small nation located in the Himalayas. With a population of more than 700,000, the country is situated between two of the world's most populated nations, China and India. Yet Bhutan has long been considered the happiest nation in the world. Since 1970, King Jigme Singye Wangchuk of Bhutan had already announced that to Bhutan, gross national happiness, or GNH, is more important than gross domestic product. Since then, Bhutan's development has been motivated by the concept of GNH, a spearheading vision that seeks to bring happiness and prosperity to the people. We stay faithful to the core mission of GNH, which is development, with values. Economic growth is important, but that economic growth must not come from undermining our unique culture or our pristine environment. In order to realize this goal, Bhutan established the Gross National Happiness Center and implemented a range of programs to popularize and apply the GNH concept into real life. Dr. Ha Ving Ta overcame 150 other applicants in the world to become the program director of the center. He is in charge of setting the learning objectives, developing the curriculum, and the learning process both for Bhutanese and international participants. As we learned in the previous clip, uh, Bhutan became the first nation in order to put what we normally know as growth, the gross domestic product or GDP uh, below what they call gross national happiness. Can you tell us what is gross national happiness? The problem with GDP is that as long as there's financial transaction, it's considered positive. But maybe these financial transactions will destroy the country. Let's imagine you would cut all the trees. Your GDP would grow very fast mm. for one year. And then you have destroyed your country. But yes. in the GDP measurement, nothing shows you that you have destroyed your country. Because GDP doesn't make a difference. It's just more transaction, the better it is. Yes. And the second thing is that GDP never measures things that are for free. If you're a parent and you take time for your children, uh, nothing in GDP because it's free. But if you don't take care of your children, but you hire a nanny, then it's very good for GDP because you have, it means you're working all the time, you have no time for your children, yes. and you have to pay the nanny. It seems that it doesn't take into any account any human interaction. Exactly. Most of the things that are really important in our life, like friendship, love, going for a walk in nature, they're for free. Therefore, they are not valued in GDP. And the same thing is with uh, businesses. If you go to a business school, you will be taught what is the goal of a business? It's to maximize profit. Mm. But that's not true. The goal of business is to satisfy human needs. Yes. In the same way, money is not a goal. Money it is means. a mean yes. to have a better life. So we have mistaken means and goals. So GNH says, Let's refocus on what really matters. So in GNH, to summarize, says that when we look at development, we should look at four things simultaneously because they are all equally important. Economic growth, of course, mm -hmm. but it has to be equitable yes. so that we don't leave some people completely on the side of the road. And it has to be, to have be sustainable. It means that our children and grandchildren will still profit from it. Mm. That's the first pillar. The second one, which is actually the most important one, is preservation of our natural environment. Mm. 
because if we destroy nature, <coughs> there will be no economy left anyway. There will be no society left. The third pillar is we must make sure that we preserve our culture. Mm. And the culture is not just a commodity for the economy. The culture is the soul and the heart of a people. Our language, our tradition, our art, our poetry, our music, our dance, but also mm. our spirituality, even our science. All that is culture. And the fourth one is gov good governance. Yes. And what is good governance is that the leaders, no matter at what level they are, as a leader of your family, leader of your corporation, leader of your community, leader of your, uh, of your country, your goal is to improve the happiness and well-being of your people. GNH is a kind of a medicine, if you want, for the illness of our times. It's really about the deep-seated causes of happiness and well-being that come from living in harmony with nature, in harmony and balance with others around you, and really being in touch uh, with yourself. And it's really central to our own personal happiness and to, I think, our survival as a, a planet. Creating a caring economy, an economy that is based on values like altruism and compassion and collaboration, solidarity rather than competition and uh, destruction of the environment. The GNH Center is really trying to put together programs for people who are interested in learning about GNH on the ground here in Bhutan. Uh, a central value underlying our programs is that uh, we can't change the world around us unless we are also looking deeply at ourselves and our own contribution to the society that we're making. <laughs> the GNH programs uh, really bring international people together to meet with Bhutanese, to have very rich discussions, to visit places where you see uh, GNH being embodied, places where GNH is being challenged and then to take the time to reflect and say, what does it mean for me personally? Are there changes in my own lifestyle, in my own relationships that would help me bring myself more in harmony with these values? Are there projects or things I could do in my own country, in my own company, uh, in my own city, in my own family that would help to reorient towards those values? Going back now to the concept of gross national happiness, if it's a program, an economic paradigm, uh, an alternative paradigm that is so, you know, um, effective, why do you think so many countries are still so hung up on following GDP? The idea of GDP came up after the Second World War, and I think it was very relevant at that time. The world was just recovering from the Second World War. There had been a lot of destruction. And almost everywhere, economic recovery was a priority. Uh, similarly, in Vietnam, after the end of the American War, of course, economic uh, development and rebuilding the country was a priority. But after a while, once you are able to meet the basic needs, if you just keep on pursuing GDP, not looking at the other factors, then you start to go in a dead end. And actually, many countries start to realize that. So uh, France, they have developed a new indicator. And it was called measuring what matters. So in the UK now, there is also the uh, National uh, Statistic Bureau of the UK is not only measuring economic growth, but is also measuring the impact of the economic growth on the well-being of the people. 20 US states have adopted what is called uh, GPI, Genuine Progress Indicators, mm. that also measures in a broader sense. And if you look at the sustainab Sustainable Development Goals, the so-called SDGs that the UN is promoting now, they have included many indicators that are more geared towards happiness and well-being and not only towards economic growth.
A number of years after the reunification of Vietnam, Dr. Ha Vinh Ta had the chance to visit the country for the first time in 1982. Seeing the remaining damage of the war really touched him. He came home and we invited some friends to speak about his journey. And he started speaking and he cried and cried and cried. And I remember I had to go out and get something to drink for him, so he stopped crying. And at that moment, actually, I knew that we are going to do something for Vietnam. It cannot only be tears, it has to be actions. Dr. Ha and his wife founded the Eurasia Foundation in 1989 for the development of physiotherapy education of those less fortunate in Vietnam. During the beginning stages, Eurasia supported existing projects in terms of infrastructure. Examples included funds to build a kitchen, buy beds, or fundraising to cover food costs. Since 1999, the Eurasia Foundation has partnered with many organizations and individuals in constructing seven schools for intellectually challenged children, as well as vocational classes and an institution for the elderly. The foundation has also organized many expertise training courses for local instructors. came to Vietnam in 1982. What brought you to Vietnam? Uh, at that time, my father was working for the United Nations. And as you probably know, in 1982, there was no tourism in Vietnam yet. Um, so, but I had the chance to go with him. And it was the first time that uh, also for him to come back to Vietnam after the war. And uh, for me, it was a discovery because I'd never been to Vietnam. So when I uh, arrived in Vietnam for the first time in 1982, it touched me very deeply because I felt a strong connection through my father and, you know, uh, my father has really uh, nourished me with Vietnamese culture, although unfortunately not with Vietnamese language, but with Vietnamese culture and, and, and values. And uh, he was uh, very much uh, patriotic. He, he loved his uh, country very much. So for me, it was very touching to, to, to experience Vietnam for the first time. So, yeah, it was a very powerful experience for me. Did Lizzie share with you this kind of uh, experience that you had in your father's homeland? We came back as a whole family in 1989, so with my wife and my cousin. So we were a whole group, and we rented a bus, and we went all the way from Saigon to Hanoi. And that's where we visited uh, Hue for the first time, which is my fa father's homeland, hometown, and all my ancestors' uh, hometown. And that was a very beautiful experience, very deep experience. And then after that, how uh, did the start of uh, Think Chup Sa begin? We had an official meeting, and then in this official meet meeting, there was one nun. And after the meeting, she came us to us and said, I, I know one student, she's 15 years old, her parents are lepers. Mm -hmm. And she will have to stop school because she has to earn money for her parents. Could you support her? so that she can continue school because she's a very good student. And we said, sure, we're happy to. How much? She said, $5 per month. In these days, $5 per month could make the difference between stopping school or being able mm. to continue her studies. So it started with small, small things like that. You know? And what we did, we, uh, we created a, a special classes in primary school so that children with disability could go to school. We created a vocation training workshop for children with disability. We created a teacher training in Hue University and also in other places. So that uh, went uh, for quite a long time and the programs grew gradually. And um, uh, eight years ago, uh, we felt that uh, we have now many children who have gone through, uh, children with disability who have gone through schools, but what can we do for them afterwards? Because mm. when they finish school, it's very difficult for them to find a job. So we decided to create a community where they could live and learn a job and experience a healthy community life. And that's how we created uh, Tintupia, which means the peaceful bamboo family. Situated on a peaceful street lined with bamboo trees in the old capital city of Hue, Ting Chuk Ja, or the peaceful bamboo family, is a home for children living with mental disabilities. But when we came here for the first time, all this land was covered with bamboo. And, and I heard the wind go through the bamboo. It was 
such a wonderful song. It was, in a way, and if you, as you could see the bamboo move and swing in the wind, and I thought this was a very good picture for what we want to do. We want to adapt ourselves to this place and we want to have this flexibility to work in a very different surrounding. After four years of construction, the community of Ting Truk Zha went into operation in 2008. This is a residential community that features career orientation workshops for the disabled youths. Depending on the youth skills, they could choose to work in workshops in lacquer painting, food processing, dried fruit making, clean vegetable garden, or embroidery. Bây giờ ra đời mà ví dụ như nó, à, cái em đi làm giả quá, thôi đừng làm nữa để tôi làm luôn đi. Đâm ra mấy em nó bị rụt rè, đâm ra cuối cùng nó bị loại ra khỏi cái cộng đồng. Còn ở đây khác, ở đây mình nói là cái khả năng em làm được việc này thôi, thì hãy làm việc đó đi. The operation takes place under the guidance of instructors who have been trained in special education and physiotherapy. Khi mà làm giáo viên chuyên biệt thì mình phải hội đủ rất là nhiều thứ. Thì phải có mà là thứ nhất là cái tình thương của mình. Mình phải dành tình thương thực sự. Nếu con tình thương mà giả tạo thì mình sẽ đến với các bạn được. Cái thứ hai là về cái trị tuệ về kiến thức của mình. Mình phải có một một số ít về trang bị về kiến thức về giáo dục đặc biệt. Khi đó mình làm việc được với các bạn. Cái thứ ba là kỹ năng khi mà mình lên lớp á hoặc là khi mình làm việc với các bạn thì mình sẽ có những cái để mà giao tiếp với các bạn theo kiểu sư phạm hoặc là theo kiểu gia đình theo kiểu xã hội. Đôi lúc các em khuyết tật vị trí nào thì có những hành vi rất bất thường có thể làm cho họ bị tổn thương hoặc có thể họ là uh, vượt qua những cái, cái biến giới về sự kiên nhẫn là họ trở nên rất cáu gắt thì như vậy thì tất nhiên cái lòng kiên nhẫn rất là cần thiết đối với họ. You and Lizzie both have um, experience in working with uh, special education children um, and working with those living with disabilities. Do you find that those uh, skills have helped you in setting up this community, this new community where um, you know, differently abled children can come and feel useful in life? Absolutely, of course, because because this was our uh, professional background, we had the skills and the experience so we could also pass it on to others. But beyond the skills, uh, I think what is really important is a, a kind of a mindset. The mindset to say, okay, this is not charity. Our work is not about charity. Mm -hmm. Our work is about creating a conducive environment where everyone can develop its best potential. And it's true for the children, the adolescent, with or without a disability. It's true for the co-workers. It's Even true. the instructors, the teachers. Absolutely. So that's what's important for me. Can we create a model of a small society, like a kind of a prototype, a pilot project, where you can show in the reality that it is possible to live in harmony together, to live in such a way that we respect and protect nature? that we can have good values, that we can preserve the environment, the culture, have a good social, vibrant social community. So in other words, put gross national happiness in practice in a small scale. What are some of your most cherished moments with the uh, students, the children, and uh, the instructors at uh, Ping Chupsa? Uh, every uh, Thursday evening, we, have a, we gather the whole community in a big circle in the evening Everybody's dressed nicely, and we in the in the middle we have like a little pond, and we put many candles, and so it looks very beautiful. It's very peaceful, and everybody is allowed to share their. We call it sharing from the heart, and uh, it creates almost miracles. We had one young man. He came. To, he has Down syndrome. He came to our community, and his parents said he cannot talk. And then after several months, in one of these evenings, suddenly he started speaking and sharing his feeling and experiences. And the parents thought we had some miracle remedies, but we didn't. What we had was a community that was willing to listen to him. Please tell us about one of the stories of, uh, of the children who st stood up and, and told you, um, you know, a, a story that touched you. 
So last uh, year, it was in um, March, I was in the community and I just received a telephone call that my mother had passed away. She was in France at that time. So I was, of course, very sad. And also I felt a little bit guilty that I was not next to her when she passed away. And it was on a Thursday. She passed away on a Thursday. So in the evening, I shared with the community my feeling. And they all listened very, you know, with a lot of empathy. And then one of our youngsters, also so-called disabled, he, you know, they do like this when mm -hmm. they want to talk, so he did like this. And then he said, he shared, oh, my mother has also passed away, so I really understand how you feel. And then he said, and I'm so happy for all those of you who still have their mother. Oh. You know, that's amazing, you know, such a compassion, such yes. an empathy, you know, and most of the time you would not listen to someone like that. Mm. But when you listen to them, you know, he could share something, you know, that really deeply touched me, that I felt, oh, he knows exactly how I feel. And not only he knows how he f I feel, but he's even able to rejoice for the luck of those who still have their mothers. So yes. this is a magical moment, right? Exactly. Today, Ting Truk Ja has another class for younger children. The opening day sees the participation of Dr. Ha's daughter, her family, and friends from Switzerland. Dr. Ha's daughter is also a pediatrician working in child development. I feel very happy and very honored. It's a beautiful place, and I'm so happy that the adolescents also have a place where they can feel happy, safe, and they can learn. They come here and really participate, and my, our son-in-law joined the board of our foundation, and my daughter's best friend jo joined the board of the foundation. And for our grandchildren, Tintukia is like part of family, you know, they, oh, grandparents are in Tintukia, okay, we go to Tintukia. It's just, for them, it's normal. It's part of their life, of their story, of family story. I think it's important for them to, to know Vietnam as it's also their, their root, their, it's, they also belong here. And it's very important for them to see this place because they actually do not grow up with the children with special needs. So it's very important they're in contact with these children and with the work of their grandfather. Maybe it will inspire their career, who knows? Maybe one of them will become or a teacher or a doctor or some and work in the same direction than their grandparents. It would be a big joy for me. <laughs> this model of Ting Chung Sa, is it something that you hope to replicate in not only other parts of Vietnam, but maybe other parts of the world as well? Well, there are uh, several hundred similar communities around the world, so, you know, but we were the first one in Vietnam. And uh, I think that um, more and more people are interested in visiting uh, our community from Hanoi, from Ho Chi Minh City, from um, Da Nang, and so, so I think there's a, a wish. Many there's a wish to replicate this model. The the challenge is to uh, to find the good people, you know. Because for instance, uh, somebody came up to us and said, "Okay, I have money and I have land, so I could start a community." And I said, "Money and land is secondary. First, yes. you have to have the good team. Yes, you have to have the people. First. You have to have the people. That's the starting point." Uh, for many years, Dr. Having Tao has applied uh, the concept of happiness within his teaching and also his uh, talks with many universities and the general public. He's been able to apply this concept of gross national happiness, but at a community level within um, universities, enterprises, and schools. Let's learn more about this in the following. Today, Dr. Ha Ving Ta is organizing a workshop on building a sustainable organization based on GNH. The event gathers human resources directors of many organizations and companies in Vietnam. They all share the common goal of searching for strategy to build a sustainable organization based on core values, still attaining economic results, all the while creating a balanced environment for employees to maximize their potential and contribute to the long-lasting development of the organization. Dr. Ha Ving Ta noted two examples of the two companies in Thailand and the U.S. which have successfully applied the GNH model in their production and management system. 
à, em ấn tượng với lại cái case study của thầy là về uh, Ellen Fisher một cái brand uh, ở bên Mỹ về thời trang thì em ấn tượng cái giải pháp là họ thu hồi những cái sản phẩm cũ và làm lại thành những cái mới uh, và giảm thiểu tối đa cái việc làm lãng phí về cái nguyên liệu thì đó cũng là một cái hay và những công ty của mình có thể là áp dụng thử hoặc là nghiên cứu về cái khoản đó là không có hạn chế cái mức tối đa cái việc là mình sẽ xả thải ra môi trường. Many express their concerns of GNH theoretical application in enterprises being a challenge to the process of gaining profit. Yet many others were quite optimistic about the potential of GNH. It's a movement generated, being generated in different countries ab about this and this is becoming really popular and I would like to believe that in years to come this will be you know kind of going to replace GNP slowly across the world and uh, you know uh, we will be measured our successes will be measured in terms of gross national happiness and I'm really optimistic about it. This is one of many workshops that Dr. Ha has held in many places across the globe to foster the application of GNH at an organization level. One of the conclusions he usually makes at the end of such workshops is the importance of connecting with oneself should one seek happiness. Cái ý nghĩa của sự kết nối là mình quay về mình làm chủ chính mình. Mình biết mình là ai, mình là người Việt Nam, mình có những cái giá trị gì, có thể là những giá trị gia đình. Và cái cách mình nhìn cái sự phát triển nó cần có cái gì, có nên bỏ đi những cái yếu tố văn hóa là không? có nên hy sinh cái giá trị về môi trường hay là không? Có nên làm cho giáo dục trở thành một cái mô hình giống như các nước phương Tây hay không? Hay làm sao đó mà cái tri thức của phương Tây kết hợp với cái tội giác của phương Đông nó là cái mô hình đúng đắn mà mình cần theo vân vân. Tôi nghĩ nếu chúng ta đặt ra những cái cách nhìn như vậy thì trong cái cách làm của mình nó sẽ có rất là nhiều sự thay đổi tích cực. Another way that the gross national happiness um, concept could be applied at community level is through enterprises. Um, and, you know, cherishing the happiness within an enterprise level will, in the end, make the business model more successful. Can you please m elaborate more on this? Yes, we have been working with a number of businesses uh, in the U.S., in Thailand, in other countries. So what we do is first we work with the staff. How do you create a happy environment within the company so that people are happy to come to work yes. and enjoy and when they're yeah, happy, work. they're more productive. Also, so it's not a contradiction with yes. being effective, on the contrary. Because mm -hmm. we know staff engagement is one of the very important dimensions for a successful company. The second level is then analyzing the impact of the company on the communities, because they have uh, factories, they have power plants, and so, so how does it impact the community? And how can we make sure that actually the business has a positive impact on the community? And the third level was, analyzing the impact of the company on the environment. Mm. So this is what is called the triple bottom line. So of course you need to have good financial results, otherwise your company will be bankrupt. Yes. But you also need to have good social results and good environmental mm. results. So three bottom line, not just one bottom line. Now, looking back on this uh, concept of happiness, do you think there is a formula to happiness in today's modern life? When we speak of happiness and well-being, the most important is that we find the right balance between the inner conditions, which are more like your mindset, your values, those happiness skills that we spoke about, and the outer condition. So the outer conditions, this is a social responsibility. Obviously, if people are starving or if they live in a polluted environment or, or if they are worried for the future of their children, how can they be happy? So the formula for happiness is the right balance between the inner and, outer. and the outer. Inspired by his uncle, diplomat Ha Van Lao, the family of Dr. Ha Ving Ta came back to Vietnam and supported Ting Duc Pagoda from the 90s and built the nursing care home for old ladies there. About 10 years later, they found out that Ta's paternal grandparents were buried in the pagoda. Suddenly I thought to myself, actually it's our ancestors who guide us what to do. Maybe they, in our dreams, they came to us and said, you have to help this pagoda. <laughs> As I grew up, uh, I became really aware of the importance of the ancestors, of those who have come before us, that we have a debt of gratitude because they have uh, worked so hard, they have done so many things to make our life possible. 
So I felt like uh, coming back to Vietnam and trying to support the country that was uh, still recovering from the war. It was like uh, paying back a debt of gratitude towards my ancestors. I think in Vietnam the worship of the ancestor is such a reality that even me, not a Vietnamese, I could connect to this ancestor stream. We talked about happiness not being a goal, a destination, but the road, the journey itself. What do you think about your journey so far? I think I've been very lucky in my life. A, I found uh, the person I love when I was very young. So, you know, oftentimes one spends a lot of time just looking for the right one and being disappointed and <laughs> things like that. So I was very lucky because uh, from very young on I had a, a real partner. Then we have wonderful children that also uh, took up our values and continue our, our work. And I was very lucky because all my life I could do, I was always, I've always asked myself, would I do with what I do if I did not get paid to do it? Mm. And if the answer was no, then I would have to change. Yes. But all my life I was able to do things that I cared for, mm. where I would say, okay, if I was not get paid, I would still do it. Yes, you did it because you loved it. Exactly, and I think that's a, a real blessing, you know, because I, I felt that um, uh, I could always do something that I felt was meaningful and that was align with my values. So if you can align your work with your values, it's something wonderful. But I feel that I travel too much. <laughs> <laughs> I spend too much time in airports and airplanes, and I work a little too much. So my goal for the next year is to reduce a little bit mm. and have more time for my own personal meditation. I you want need to, to write go back to your inner. Exactly. And I your want outer is a little bit too much too now. Much. Yes. So the balance that I was speaking about is not 100% yet. Mm. I need to focus a bit on the inside. I want to write more and also have more time with my grandchildren. Yes, <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Dr. Ha, for joining us here on Talk Vietnam, sharing your story, your concept of happiness, and most of all, to see people for not what they are, but who they are, um, truly in the heart. Yes, thank you. I wish you happiness. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and that has also wrapped up this edition of Talk Vietnam, a very meaningful edition uh, to learn more about what it is that truly makes us happy um, the condition that will help us to be happy about ourselves, be happy about those around us, and to learn more about our, our surroundings in order to be a more meaningful addition to society. Thank you so much for joining us here in our Talk Vietnam, and we'll see you more next time. Goodbye for now.